Hello and welcome to the Strong Suit Podcast, where we focus on the people part of your business. Every Tuesday and Thursday, I interview a world-class expert on talent and recruiting so that you can build a company filled with rock stars. And if you're looking for rock stars, one of the most common type of individual candidate you're probably thinking about are IT software developers. Arguably the hardest type of person to find in today's market. And my guest today focuses specifically on this area. His name is Steve, Steve Acho of the Solstice Consulting Group based in Detroit. Now, Steve and his team focus on a very specific area of IT, which are data people, data warehousing, business intelligence, big data. But a lot of what we're gonna talk about over the ne next 20 minutes, I would argue, and I think he would agree, can apply to all kinds of recruiting challenges. So with that, please welcome my guest, Steve. How are you, Steve? I'm great, thanks so much for having me today, Jeff. It's nice to have you on the show for a number of reasons. You're, you're a real renaissance man, which I can appreciate. And, and you've real, really built a great specialist practice. And over the next 20 minutes, I want to ask for some of your advice for our listeners who need to recruit either technology people or data people or, or frankly, just IT people. Yeah. As a starting point, what do you think is this, the biggest myth or thing that people get wrong when it comes to hiring technology people. We're, we, the thing that if you don't get this right, the rest kind of gets screwed up from the very beginning. Mm. Well, I think um, before I answer that direct question, there's the story that I like to tell about uh, a woman that makes a roast for her family and her husband sees her do this all the time. And every time she does it, she cuts off the ends of the roast and puts it in the oven. And her husband, after years of seeing her do this, says, why do you cut off the ends? And she says, I don't know. My mom showed me that way. So she calls her mom and she asks her mom and she says, I don't know, your grandma showed me that way. And they call the grandma and she says, oh, when we first came to this country, we had a tiny apartment, a tiny oven and the roast wouldn't fit. Oh my. And so, you know, every industry, every business, every job, every household probably has multiple examples where we continue to do things because that's how we learned them. And there's certain kind of dogmas of yeah. behavior, right? These bad habits and, that people get into that have that no reason question. behind them. Yeah. And, and. And the point is that at some point, there probably was a good reason, right? Arguably. In some cases, I can't even find one. But, but in some cases, there was a good reason. But nobody stopped to inspect, is this the best way? So the answer to that question, I think, is part of the, the dogma of hiring, where we used to do it in newspapers and mail resumes, and then we faxed, and then now we're using computers. And, and we're essentially just getting more efficient at chopping off the ends of the roast without asking, does it make sense to chop off the end of the roast? And so, so I think it's a fabulous story. It's a great analogy. One of the key mistakes that I see that I, I, I know you feel passionately about, so I really want to drill into this for a minute, is this hunt for very specific skills. Mm. So nine out of 10 job descriptions, <laughs> you know as well as I do, three to five years of this. Mm five to seven years of that. And, and this and that are languages or skill sets, Java, HTML, whatever it is. Mm. What is the fundamental flaw with that approach? I think the two, there are two big ones. One of them is that if you're qualifying people, first of all, I think everybody on the planet agrees with me on this first one. You are going to hire someone, whether it's your son or your brother-in-law or someone you worked with or someone that you have no context for that just applied for a job. You're going to hire them because you believe they're capable of doing the work and they're motivated to do the work, right? Like at some point, whatever your interview process is yep. or isn't, whatever your process is, right? Um, the flaw is that when you assign arbitrary requirements and you don't describe the work, um, the two biggest problems with that is that you end up disqualifying people that don't have those qualifications, but they may very well be the best at doing the work, but they have three years of Java and not five. Right. Or, or, honestly, or a different sometimes. version of a language that they might exactly. need to spend a month learning this version. Something that, the point is, these people might be the best in the business to do what you need them to do, but you never told them what you needed them to do. You just forced them to fit within that. The other problem, which is way more prevalent, because you'll never hear from the first yeah. group, yeah. is that you're qualifying people that can't do the work. And sometimes that's their fault, and, some, and usually I blame it on the company. I blame it on the organization that starts the conversation saying, let's talk. I'll only talk to you, though, if you meet these yeah. requirements. Yeah. And that's yeah. not a good start of a conversation. It's almost a lazy 
approach to recruiting where I can quickly yeah. filter out black and white. They have this, right. they have that. I can give it to HR or someone who doesn't really understand the role, but I can make it clear black and white. I don't want to see anyone unless they meet these specs. But to your broader yeah. point, Steve, we, we lose the forest for the trees. We don't even know if they can do what it is we're asking them to do. And we haven't asked them to do anything. That's the biggest problem with job descriptions is they're usually just person descriptions. So when so it comes to a technology job description, mm, sure. what does that look like? I'm not asking well, you to write it on the, on the spot. Yeah, what, sure. What does it sound well, like to, to someone that hasn't seen one like that? Right. Well, in terms of, this is what I see with most job postings with most companies is they do a really good job branding the company. Come work for this company. We are a fun, energetic, blah, blah, blah. We have yeah. pool tables. We have pizza party Fridays, whatever it is. And then they say, uh, let's get out of technology even. Senior accountant, we're hiring a senior accountant. And then they say, job description, must have seven <laughs> plus years. <laughs> they right? skip, they skip the, the, what, the, per, what the job is all about. Right, and so the, the two problems with that are, one, that is not an enticing way to, I would say, market to someone who is capable and motivated to do that job, yep. not just someone who wants a job and hopes yep. they can pass the test, right? And so what it normally looks like is a decent attempt to brand the company and no attempt at all to brand the job because that accounting job might not sound interesting to you and I, but if you would phrase it something like, rather than say you must have X years of experience, yep. make it sound exciting to the right person. We are uh, for the first time, re-engineering our accounting system and merging it with uh, a company that we just purchased yep. and blah, blah, blah. That might not sound exciting to you and I, but to an accountant who has options. It'll turn the right person on and the wrong people off, which is- Which exactly is exactly what, what advertising should do, right? Like, don't advertise the new iPhone to my grandmother. Right. It's a waste of advertising dollars. So, right? so what I hear you saying is think about the job description as an advertisement, not as a scorecard, which you should have separately, Perfect. which is which are, which are the specific things we're looking for. Sure. Let's move. Let's say we get that right. Let's move to mm -hmm. sourcing. Mm -hmm. What is working these days, Steve? When it comes to IT and developers, it is so hard to find these people. Mm -hmm. Where are you finding them that actually works? Well, I think I have a different mentality when it comes to just filling the funnel with potential candidates for for roles. So one we spend a good portion, a good percentage of our time just networking with great people who have great skills that they can articulate. So I have this whole database of people that aren't just tagged for certain technologies that they have, but they can say, I thrive in a role where I'm an architect using this kind of technology in this industry and I'm willing to travel anywhere in the US, right? Like I have a database of those people and I'm talking to them before I need them. And I think you're just building a, the pipeline ahead of time as opposed to just in time hiring. And I think just in general, that's good business advice that I give to young people all the time, which is the time to build your network is before you need it. Of course, of course. I mean, that's just, just an overarching principle. So to find these people, you have, you have a few different strategies that, um, that change based on how you're reaching out to them. So if I have no context for someone, I might find the best. I might find the author of a book that wrote about this technology and ask for a referral. Who has impressed you before, right? Yep. So now I'm going to people that are gainfully employed and starting the conversation, not like a used car salesman saying, I've got the perfect job for you. I have no idea what's perfect for them. They're strangers. Yeah. It would be presumptive assume to assume that, right? It, it really, and it's kind of a turnoff. I don't like when people do that to me. If you see me drive my car in the lot and you look at it, and you say, I've got the perfect car for you. You don't know anything about that. That might not even be my car, right? Yeah, right. So what I do is I say, I'm, I'm looking to hire this kind of person. Would you be interested in discussing to see if it might be a good opportunity for you? I don't know if it will, but here's the basics of it. If you're not open to New York or LA or Detroit or whatever it is, it's a deal breaker, but I'm giving them the least amount and leaving it to them. Would you be open to exploring? That's the push side. On the pull side, when I have to put a job posting out there, I make damn sure that it's interesting yep. to the right person. So we talked about that, the compelling part, right? The other part is I absolutely make sure that the outcomes of the role are there. And this is the biggest thing that I want people to take away. I don't care who you're hiring. It doesn't have, have to do anything with technology. But if you can list three to five performance objectives. Actual outcomes, deliverables. Which every one of them should start with a verb. 
Mm -hmm. Every one of them. So there's no such thing. Debug the the software. Exactly. There's 20% fewer errors or whatever. Upgrade, install, architect, build. You know, we we could go on and on with these verbs, but you can't say good communication skills because that is out of context. Right. Unless I know what, where those are going to apply, right? It's also so vague to be meaningless. First of all, everyone says they have good communication skills. Right. That's and what I always joke about. Who's going to look at it and say, yeah. oh, I've checked all the boxes, but right. my, compu- my communication right. skills. This goes back to what you were saying earlier, Steve. It really is just handed down generation to generation that this is how you hire people. Mm-hmm. Most people have never really stopped to think, why are we doing it this way? And I think I know why they're doing it. And it's a fundamental shift in strategy that, that you alluded to a minute ago. There definitely is. I'm not denigrating and I'm not criticizing the problem because it's a real problem of how do I get through 300 resumes of people that apply, right? It's logistical reality. I've got to, I've got to get it down to 30. Sure. And so the, the strategy that people have used forever, and this is the, this is the chopping off the ends of the roast issue is weed out the weak. And how do you weed out the weak? Well, if 300 resumes come in, you can have a very low paid person yeah. or now you can just have a fancy algorithm. Yeah. They're, they're all out there that just get rid of all the people that don't have five years of X and yeah. don't have a master's degree and don't yeah. have this. It's and almost so like we're automating the, the insanity of the whole thing, right? <laughs> right. So you're applying automation to make something more efficient. That's ineffective yeah. that you shouldn't do in the first place. And so that is called weed out the weak. And my argument is that when you go about it with that strategy, the best you can hope for is to find the least bad person yeah. who, who sucks least to work. Right. That's it. Right yeah. now. My strategy and my, my business partner, and I joke about this all the time, we say, we don't actually need to do any work to weed out the weak. The weak are happy to weed themselves out. Okay, so here's, this is an actionable tip that everybody can use. Even if you're just hiring someone for two days to, uh, let's say, do an illustration of the book cover that you're writing, right? It doesn't even matter what it is, is you get to the outcomes and you say, this is what you have to do in order to be successful in this role. And then the job posting goes out and let's say you get a hundred people to apply. Well, what I, what we do in in my company and and the way that we have this set up is that they just get an auto reply when they apply. So I don't look at resumes or cover letters yet. Yeah. They have a chance to qualify themselves. And there's an interim step that you insert. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there, so I'm giving them a chance. Yeah. What does that step look like? So there's an auto responder and what do I, I'm the candidate. What do I get? You're the candidate and you get, Thanks so much for your interest in this role, Jeff. As you see from the job description, these are the things, these are the three most important things you'll have to do. Please reply with a one sentence, concise uh, overview of just for each one, the most relevant accomplishment. So if I said install Windows Server 2012, you can say I have installed Windows Server 2012. At Literally days. one sentence. That's it. I want one sentence. And so what I'm actually doing is I'm testing for things that are important. I don't want to read a resume that says I pay attention to detail. I want to see if someone pays attention to detail. Right. Can they even follow basic instructions, right? So, so 97% of them, by the way, won't even respond, which is fine with me because wait, 97%. I get 3%. I get 3%. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the reasons why I think that is much of it is laziness, but much of it is also the way the internet works. Now, if you're a job seeker, you can search for a job on just about any topic yeah. and a thousand things come up and you can blindfold yourself and yeah. apply yeah. all. Yeah. So people aren't even reading this stuff, right. Right? right? But I'm still giving them the benefit of the doubt. I'm still not weeding them out. They yeah. are weeding them out, right? So we don't even pay anybody less than like $70 an hour. Okay. If for that kind of money, you don't have three minutes to articulate what you do, you weeded yourself out. I didn't. So let's play, devil, let's play devil's advocate because I love what you've described. It, yep. it totally makes sense with the exception of someone who's not actively looking for a job. But I think what you're mm-hmm. talking about are inbound only, correct? I'm only talking about okay. inbound for that. So now let's, let's set that aside because I, sure. I think we'd all agree that what you just described makes a lot of sense. I'm going to implement that on wherever possible. Outbound mm-hmm. candidates who are not the prospects, who are not mm-hmm. looking. Right especially your, your focus expertise, Steve, which is developers, IT folks, data folks. Mm-hmm. How do you engage them? They're not so that's actively looking. What's that's that? That's more of a dance. That, that yeah. is less so of what, a one to we, two time transaction. Yeah, so bring so, us in their, in their mind the, these days. Yep. What is, aside from money, mm-hmm. what is important to them? Well, actually, I can't answer that. They can. That's the question. So I end up 
meeting some great people that have, I mean, I can give you a specific example of a gentleman that I connected with last week who is working for American Express. He's a very high level software engineer, extremely bright guy. You could not have, uh, you could not have gleaned this from his resume without a conversation that started with, I have an LA based opportunity. I see that you're a bit far from LA, but here's what it is. Would you be interested in exploring? We connected. I told him about it and I said, before I even tell you about the actual job, what would you consider a good career opportunity? He said, well, one, I'm looking at moving to LA, so that's great. Two, uh, a smaller company. He didn't even know what size the company was, right? So he's telling me what's important to him. He's not selling me anything. I'm in the mode of selling him. So you're getting him talking first. Absolutely, I wanna know what's important to him. And then once he's described it and it's very clear in your mind, that it is not a fit with this opportunity you're currently Absolutely. working on. Tell him right away. How, how do you do that without, how, how do you do that? What do you say? Well, I would say it sounds like you would consider it a career opportunity to go to a smaller company. And this is a company that's just as big as the one you're working for. So what is it that you don't like about the big company? And he said, well, you know, I, I feel like I can't really make an impact. And I, I'm sure you're going to feel the same way here, but let's keep in touch because I have other opportunities. I have another client. I'm not sure they're hiring right now, but here's what they do. Does that interest you? Yeah, that's the kind of thing that interests me. So there are conversations that start with what is interesting to you, and I'm essentially a matchmaker, and I'm not pushing anyone to do anything. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. And it applies to, like you said, every role, every function, every industry, every company size. If you're reliant on just posting on job boards, you're missing the whole point of the process, which is, like you said, Steve, to be a matchmaker. Well, unfortunately, not to deter anyone from applying for jobs, because I'm not, but you have a one in 250 chance of getting a job by applying for it. So 80% of the job market is conversations and people that you know. But to, to what you just said with the candidate that I'm reaching out to, the great thing about that is a month later, I have such a strong argument with one of my clients to say, I'd like to introduce you to one of my candidates Um, it didn't work out with this other company because they weren't like you. Yeah. You're like you. This is why this, so in other words, my sale is accurate and honest and upfront and it's coming from like, I'm essentially proposing something in the form of a person that is a business solution to a problem. And I'm saying, here's why I believe this proposal is this person is capable and motivated to do work with you. And it's, you know, the, the last thing on my list is this guy uses node.js. And yeah, sure. This code, it's, it's the last thing on there. So if you're not focused on these, let's call them keywords of skills, mm-hmm. this, this is a very detailed question or logistical question, but I think people are probably wondering, how do I do this? Mm-hmm. You talk to dozens, hundreds, thousands of individuals over time. Mm-hmm. How are you storing that data so that you're not relying on your memory? Oh, I would uh, never rely on my memory. Be, right, because you, if you're not searching for, like you said, C++, Java, whatever, mm-hmm. how are you extracting that out yeah. of your, your database right. around these, so, let's call them softer, fuzzier types of DNA things? Yep. Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think I unnecessarily or unintentionally Um, take the focus away from the skills, but I don't mean to do that completely. So we do have a CRM that we use and we definitely make sure that any candidate or person we've worked with or person we might work with, the person we might have worked with is all in there. And we do tag them based on the technology. So I definitely do. So you do tag them based on the skills that they have. Yep. But now I'm really reading because underneath that, let's say I have 20 C++ people. Well, five of them will go anywhere in the country yeah. and the other 15 are you know, right. only specific areas. And then I look at those five and I say, this guy is only interested in a full-time job and this other guy is only interested in a consulting role and this woman is only interested in six-month projects. And so yep. those aren't really soft. They're just preferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're important right. to know to make the two-way match. But and- to your point, I really am tagging them based yep. on technology because the technology is super important. I don't mean to set it aside, yep. but what, again, like th- I think this is the principle to remember. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter if you have an MBA, if you have a computer science degree, if you have a thousand contacts, 
the only thing that matters is what you do with what you have. So yep. I don't care about your 10 years of experience with C++. Yep. I care about what you do with that experience. And that's what I pitch to clients. I, I couldn't agree more, Steve. It's a, it's a fundamental rethink of the whole process. You, you mentioned a CRM. What, what system do you store your stuff in? Uh, we have, what is that one called? It's from 37 Signals. Oh, uh, Basecamp? Basecamp? Well, Basecamp is the team. Oh, that's their project management. Yeah. High Rise. High Rise. Yeah, high Rise. Sorry, I forgot the name but of it. That, but that's your candidate yeah. tracking system. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Steve, this is great. We appreciate you making the time and sharing your wisdom, which I think is basically advice to do the opposite of what everyone else does. Yeah. Um, how can people learn more about Solstice or get in touch with you if they are in the need for any kind of data person? Thank you. Well, um, I'm always on LinkedIn, and I think I'm the only person with this name, but it's just Steve Acho, A-C-H-O. And I have a website that kind of has a very short link or very short bio on each of my little professional uh, different career things here, including Solstice and the other things that I do. And that's at steveachoresources.com. Fantastic. Steve, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you, Jeff.